Welcome, everyone. Um, hope you all are enjoying your co our conference so far. My name is Shanta Sagai, and I am the Autism Alliance of Michigan Insurance Specialist. Today, we will be talking to you about a couple of key things. As you noticed, our title is D for deductible. And we're just going to kind of go through a couple of steps and walk you through what is, you know, what is your bottom line, basically? What does that look like for families? Um, today with me, I have Justine Bell, who I will give the opportunity to introduce herself. And we just ask that if you have any questions, please, uh, please feel free to put the questions in the chat. We will make some um, stops throughout to be able to answer those questions. Also, after this session, we will have like a one-on-one -on -one Q and A kind of a thing. So, if you have some specific questions about your specific policy that you would like answered, or you have some specific questions about, you know, something that's coming up with your policy or something, then we'll be more than happy to do that. In the chat, we just ask that you do not put in any specific questions about your specific policy because this is a recorded um, session. Also at the end of the session, we'll be more than happy to go over with you um, some additional tips or anything that you're interested in. All right, so I think that's all the housekeeping things. I'll go ahead and let Justine introduce herself. Hello, everybody. I am so happy to be here. My name is Justine Bell, and I am the Medical Lines Coordinator for Cedar River Insurance. So I help people find medical insurance. Um, and I'm just excited to jump in and answer all of your questions. All right, let's get started. So today we're going to cover insurance options, what therapies are covered with um, most health plans that we'll be talking about today, popular terminology, market plan comparisons, and then at the end we'll just do like a quick overview going over all the information that we talked about. So there's three different kind of ways to be able to get healthcare coverage. As the first you see here, it's going to be talking about commercial plans. The other two are Medicaid. And then the third is just looking at benefits overall through the healthcare.gov. So basically a commercial plan is usually what you get through your employer. So if you go to work for, let's just say General Motors, so to speak, they will give you an employer sponsored plan. And that is the plan that you'll use in order to be able to get benefits. The commercial plan is broken up into two categories. We like to call them um, self-funded and fully funded. They both have to have an essential health benefit and they have to look a certain way. And so what Justine is gonna do right now is kind of go over what those criteria are and what you should be looking for um, in your health plan. One of the questions that I get a lot, um, especially working with my autism families, is how ABA therapy is covered. Um, and that is really split up into essential health benefits. So there are certain plans that require essential health benefits, including ABA, and there are certain plans that don't, and people tend to be confused about that. So I wanted to go over that quickly. So the types of plans that have the EHB mandatory and are required to include ABA therapy are anything that you get on the individual marketplace, anything that is small group. So if your company that you work for employs two to 49 people, they should have a small group plan and that plan is required to um, cover the essential health benefits and you should have ABA therapy on there. Um, that is considered fully funded. Uh, so that is funded by the insurance company. If you are working for a company that has 50 or more employees, so General Motors is a great example, then they have what is called a large group policy. And even if it is fully funded large group, they get to pick and choose what coverages they provide and what coverages they don't provide. They are not required to have those essential health benefits. So it can be really confusing because some of those plans may include ABA therapy and some of them do not because it is not required. That is a decision that's made through your HR department and Autism Alliance of Michigan has resources that they can help provide you so that you can try and request that that get added. 
they're an amazing resource for that. Um, the other option is self-funded. And that means that a, a company is putting a certain money away into an account so that they can self-fund claims. And then they are um, using a health insurance contracts, um, their provider networks, but they are funding themselves. And those plans also are not mandatory. So large companies with self-funded plans are also not required to follow those essential health benefit requirements. And also if you are at the end of this um, in a week from now, the recording will be available online. And what you'll also notice is We'll also put like a sheet in there with some of the links that'll kind of explain to you a little bit more about an essential health benefit, what that means and why it's important in insurance. So you'll be able to look that up and kind of like read through it yourself. So the other types of insurance coverage are um, through Medicaid or a child only policy, which is through the Affordable Care Act. Also, um, the website for that would be healthcare.gov and that'll be in like the little toolkit thing that we'll go over at the end. So some important things to know about a Medicaid plan is we like to call it the introduce you to the five step process. And you get a referral from the doctor, you go through community mental health, no matter what type of Medicaid plan you have. So even if you have a Medicaid specific HMO, you would still have to go through the community mental health in your area. So you would go through community mental health. And after that, they would give you a supports coordinator. Your supports coordinator would set up the services for you. And then from there, you would be able to then go and receive ABA services. So the supports coordinator and all of those processes are specific to ABA therapy. You can still get a supports coordinator and all of the other services, but in order to get ABA, you do have to go through that five-step process. If you have speech, PT, and OT services that you're looking at getting, you can just take those to your, um, to your uh, speech pathologist or whatever, and they will be able to just provide those services for you. So you don't necessarily have to go through the completed CMH process in order to receive those services. In regards to a child only policy on the Affordable Care Act, we do these a lot. When you have a situation that is large group or self-funded, where they do not provide ABA therapy. So you can go to your HR department and you can um, try and request that they do decide to cover that. But if they do not, then a child only policy on healthcare.gov um, is an option for you. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but because those are required to cover the essential health benefits, that is an option. We like to, because we know that this gets a little bit confusing, you're gonna see a couple different <laughs> forms of how this process works. So a couple different flow charts of it. So basically we are starting from the beginning. We talked about the three different types, right? So you have the commercial insurance that you get through your employer, you have the Medicaid, or you have the child only policy through the Affordable Care Act. And basically this chart kind of just shows you how all of those work together and what that looks like. So this is just another reiteration of what we previously told you. This breaks it down. So it goes into what things you, what services you can get from each provider. Justine kind of talked about if you work for an employer that doesn't have the benefit, how you're more than welcome to contact us at the Autism Alliance of Michigan, and we can try and help you facilitate those conversations with the HR department. And then if you have a fully funded plan, also, if you have a plan through the Affordable Care Act, then this is how you kind of go about getting the services. So you've done all the steps, you've figured out what kind of insurance you have, you're ready to then take that coverage and go and get your medical diagnosis. Something that is important to note here is that when you get your medical diagnosis, it is totally different than having a education certification. 
So just remember that even if your school gives you a autism certification, if you haven't received it through a medical diagnosis, so through a, a, through a pediatric neurologist or someone that specializes in diagnosing autism, then you are not covered to then receive some of the additional services. And I just wanna go back really quickly I just wanna talk about a little bit. So I know a lot of people have the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan and I just wanna walk you through how this looks differently for you. So Blue Cross Blue Shield does require that families go to um, an approved autism evaluation center. So when you're looking at your benefits through Blue Cross Blue Shield, just remind yourself that even though it's a self-funded plan, you still have to go through an, some form of an authorization process. So just remember to look at that process and that plan before you start. So even before you get your medical diagnosis, just make sure that you're going to the appropriate place that is qualified through your insurance. Just wanted to put that in there because I know a lot of people have the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. And also within the authorizations, remember that parent training is included. So all of the plans, no matter what insurance coverage you have, you always have a parent training component. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that parent training component is important um, when we start talking about policies and bottom line payments. But just remember that in all of this, the reason you're learning all this information and you're being an advocate and learning how to pick is so that you can better assist your children get the services that they need. All right. So back to the medical diagnosis. So you get the medical diagnosis. You can, if you are working with the Medicaid program, then all you need is a referral from your primary care physician. And they'll either do the MCHAT or some type of ASD screening. If you have a commercial plan to get the diagnosis, you should contact them because then they will tell you what you need to do next. So in the case of the Blue Cross Blue Shield, you have to go to an approved autism center. In the case of like Health Alliance plan, you might just have to go see a pedi neuro pediatric neurologist or a pediatric um, neuropsychiatrist, but they will tell you who you need to go see in order to get the appropriate diagnosis. Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, there's a question I felt yeah. was relevant right now. Do okay. companies that provide autism services have to work with Medicaid if you have it? Um, do companies, ask me one more time, say it again. Do companies that provide autism services have to work with your Medicaid if you have it? Um, no, a company chooses what insurances that they, um, that they take or don't take. Sometimes there are requirements if there's like state funding. So if the state pays for a part of them being open, then maybe they may be required to accept Medicaid. Um, but in general, no, um, any particular set of services, any particular service center gets to decide who they work with and who they don't work with. And the, I think the most important part about that to remember is when we start talking about the topic, right? D is for deductible. When we start talking about the bottom line, and once you start looking at those figures, exactly what Justine said, your provider can pick and choose who they want to work with. But just remember that that could potentially affect your out of pocket and your bottom line. Is there another question or are we okay? There's one more, but I'm not sure if you're going to go into it. Can okay. a child only plan through the ACA or can you get a child only plan through the ACA if you already have a commercial insurance? So we are going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk about it extensively. So um, keep that in mind and we'll make sure that we answer it more specifically when we get to it. But we are definitely going to talk about the child only policy and how that works. All right, so we're looking at what's covered. So you've got your diagnosis, you're ready to go to therapy, and then you don't know which therapy. So usually when you get the diagnosis, they'll suggest services that you should take. So they'll say, okay, maybe 20 hours or ABA therapy. They'll suggest speech, PTOT. These are all considered for us evidence-based therapies and practices. And so no matter 
pretty much where you are in the process. These are considered approved evidence-based therapies. Also included in those, you would have the medication, nutrition, and psychological services. So when we're looking at these different um, therapies, Justine kind of talked a little bit about the essential health benefits, and these therapies are included within that umbrella as well. So some of the therapies, and we're going to go over like what to look for in each therapy. So what your provider should look like, what kind of treatment, what the treatment will look like, treatment goals and things like that. But basically, just remember that for autism or for the diagnosis of autism, these are generally speaking your services that you'll get. We're going to talk a lot more about medication um, towards the end and the different tiers and how that works. But if you could kind of talk about nutrition and how that plays into these um, evidence-based practices, Justine, that would be great. Yeah. Do you want to pop back one slide real quick? Absolutely. So um, one important uh, definition here that I think uh, we will touch on quickly is the things on the left are therapy-based services. Um, and generally based on your, your um, diagnosis for autism. The things on the right are not not covered. Um, they can be covered, but they're not based on that autism diagnosis. So almost all insurance policies will cover medication, um, but usually it is independent of that, um, that diagnosis. Um, and then uh, almost all policies, again, this is one of those um, essential health benefits, will cover psychological services. The reason that the medication and the psychological services are starred are because that is generally included in almost all policies. Nutrition is a weird space because there's so many different schools of nutrition and there's so many different requirements. So we suggest if you're considering a nutritionist to make sure that it is somebody who is in network with your insurance company if you're expecting your insurance to pay for it. Um, so an important thing for um, knowing what you're going to pay for and what you're not going to pay for. Um, nutrition is just a weird space for that. So make sure you're um, double checking that. And then we can go on to the next one. I was gonna say, even with included in these, it's probably good to note at this point too, that some things that are not included are special diets, um, supplements. And I hear a lot of people ask, or a lot of people call us about the hyperbaric oxygen chambers, these are not services that would be covered under your medical benefit. So if you wanted to utilize those services, you definitely could do so. Um, and I would suggest that you contact your, you know, your provider, your insurance provider, and talk to them potentially about using flexible spending for that. Um, but this is not something that your medical benefit itself would cover. Correct. Um, so, oh, good. Uh, yeah. Yes, this is just a basically restating the things that we just talked about. Um, we'd like to make sure that people are understanding and feeling comfortable with the things. So um, autism benefit and things that can be included in those insurance. Um, but always one of the things you'll hear us say over and over through the presentation is to make sure that you're checking with your insurance company on um, staying in network and um, covered services. And not only checking, but checking often and frequently, right? So what I have sometimes happens is somebody will call on Monday and they'll say, they'll get somebody over the phone and they'll say, oh yeah, that's absolutely an okay thing. And then they'll call on Tuesday and they'll say, well, it was, but maybe it's not. So make sure that you are calling every time something changes and make sure that you're understanding, you're getting updated on that information. Also, if you have questions about your diagnosis code, right? So those are things that you can be asking for. The DSM-5 is a fancy name of saying a diagnosis code. Uh, also, what procedures are they gonna be doing? So all of these evidence-based services that we're showing you here are associated with a procedure code or some type of a five digit code that is allowing your, your provider to be able to build the insurance. So making sure that you are aware of these codes and 
what services are covered and checking in frequently with your insurance company to make sure that you understand where you are in that process. It can also be useful to just say, if you get somebody on the phone at the insurance company who doesn't seem to be sure, you are your child's advocate. So feel free to say, you know, is there somebody that I can talk to that might be, you know, a, hundred, a little bit more sure on this? Or can you double check that for me? And then document. I yeah. always say document. Like when you always call document. To always document so that way you're kind of keeping a track as well for yourself right so you know that you called when you got the first diagnosis and you called to see about the evaluation and just keep in mind the evaluation number or five digit code might be different than the actual code that you're going to be using every week so you might have to call more than once but when you call just make sure you document document what code you called about um what time you called, who you talked to, if they're willing to give that information. And sometimes I even document what number I called. So if I have to go back and backtrack, then I know I called the customer service number or I called the authorization department. And that might be the difference in finding out the exact information. Also, just remember that you might have a primary insurance, but your insurance might have a separate authorizations department. So you have to be familiar with that as well. And I think we talked a little bit more about making sure about authorizations and how you can keep track of that information too. So you, we talked about what those evidence-based services look like, but here we're gonna just kind of give you a glimpse of the type of people that are usually per performing those services. So for ABA, you usually have a board certified behavior analyst. ABA is one of the therapies that requires 25% parent participation. So this is important because in order for you to keep getting your child's authorization, you have to be actively engaged in helping your child do better. And the most important thing about all of this is that at the end of the day, you are your child's biggest advocate. You know them better than anybody else. And I've had people ask me, you know, if you go to a BCBA and you feel like their personality isn't meshing well with your child's personality, can you switch BCBAs? You absolutely can switch BCBAs. Um, what I would also like to include is that this therapy, as well as all the other therapies, should be giving you some type of a monthly goal. Um, so they should, or a monthly report saying, these are the goals that we worked on this month. These are the goals. These are our short-term goals. These are our long-term goals. Here is what we're going to be looking for from these goals. So we expect for the child to do this behavior three out of five times without, without prompting with a percentage of accuracy. So you should be looking for that type of reporting every month for sure, and making sure that you are actively engaged in the parent participation. So BCBAs and ABA therapy um, help with behavior management, skill development. And I was just talking to you about the data-driven portion. So three out of five trials, two out of five trials with 60% or 70% um, prompting or intervention. These are the type of goals that you should be looking for within all of your therapists. Another thing that is important about ABA is you want to see um, a transition. So if your child is able to do something at therapy and then you get home and it looks like you've never been to therapy, you definitely need to consider and ask your therapist, okay, these are the things that I'm trying at home and what do I need to do to modify that so that we can get the same results that you're getting in therapy. The next type of therapist that um, a lot of families might interact with is a speech pathologist. And they work on things like receptive and or expressive language, social language skills, communication, literacy. They can also work on feeding and swallowing and the, this therapy usually is like a 30 minute session, sometimes once, sometimes twice a week. So just make sure that you are talking to your therapist. This 
Although this therapy does not require a 25% parent intervention, you should still be in the habit of touching base with your therapist on a regular basis. And the reason I can't stress this enough is because when we're talking about money, although we love our children and we care about them, we still have to be cognizant of spending. And so if you're doing the parent interaction and you're appropriately managing that, then we're here to talk about our bottom line, right? So we're talking about money. This in the long run can help you with financial, um, with financially being able to offer your child more services even outside of therapy. Excuse me, Shanta? Yeah. Going back to speech, I believe this parent question is asking, should that service be covered in full with an autism diagnosis? Well, okay, these are two questions, I think. With okay. an autism diagnosis, do copays apply when you have a diagnosis? So We're gonna talk about oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Justin. <laughs> We're going to talk about that a little bit later, too. Um, we'll get into some common um, terminology for health insurance plans, but yes any therapies should be treated the same as the other things on your health insurance plan. So if you have a copay for therapies, then you should pay the copay. If you do not have a copay for therapies, then you'll pay full price, agreed rate, up to your deductible, and then a percentage from your deductible to your maximum out of pocket. And then once you hit your maximum out of pocket, you should not have a copay or coinsurance for them anymore. And we'll talk through that again in a little bit. And I think something that's important to note is that um, when a lot of people get the autism benefit, they say they get an unlimited benefit. And so even though um, you can go as many times as you like, and you don't have like a 30 limit cutoff or a 10 limit cutoff, you still have to pay those co-pays when you go until you reach your out-of-pocket max. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Just double checking. So just keep in mind, so some people go to ADA and they go um, like three days a week. You still have those co every time you go, even though your visit limit is unlimited. Did that answer the question? She said, thank you. Okay. And any other questions? This one, um, unlimited means only one per one hour per day for priority health. Is that common? Um, for speech, is that what you mean? OT. OT. Um, mm, I don't think so. Not with the autism writer, but that would be a question that you should definitely come and talk to us about after about and then that way we can actually ask you more questions to figure out what kind of plan you have um to me that sounds like you might be receiving unlimited benefits for particularly aba services but you might not be receiving unlimited for occupational therapy which means that they're doing something weird with it but like i said that would be an excellent question for you to ask us um during the end and the Q&A because there's a whole bunch of questions that I think Justine and I are going to ask you to find out for sure <laughs> like what is going on if that's okay. Is that okay? It's so hard because okay. everybody has like there there are individual questions so we'll, we want to try and get all the general stuff out of out of the way. And then when somebody throws something like that at us, both Shanta and I want to like really dig deep into it. And like, but this is not like, we don't want to do that for everybody. Right. So we are excited to get into that problem um, as soon as the presentation is yeah. done and we can go to Q&A. Yeah. I was thinking like, please come to the Q&A so I can help you because <laughs> I really want to figure that out. <laughs> yep. All right. But yes. So the general answer to that would be, it sounds like you're, you're not receiving the unlimited benefit right now, but we could definitely ask you a couple more questions to delve into it because it doesn't sound like that's accurate at this point. All right, anything else for us, Kara? This one, um, 
why do I get services until I'm, why do I only get services until I'm 26? I have autism and Medicaid. Um, um, are you getting ABA services right now? When you are disabled, there is a possibility that you can stay. I'm assuming that you are on Medicaid, but also um, receiving insurance from parents. Again, this is one of those where we need, we've got questions and we're going to dive into it um, in the Q&A. Um, but you can only keep your parents' insurance until the age of 26. There are things that you can file in order to extend that if you have um, a, a registered disability. So again, that's something that we can jump into a little bit um, further, but the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, um, mandated that children were allowed to stay on their parents' coverage until 26. So that's a really common place where we can see some um, loss of services. All right, we all good? Yes, ma'am. All right. So psychological testing, basically that is how you go about getting your evaluation or your diagnosis, I'm sorry. And that's your evaluation process. Um, also, you might have to do some follow-up testing. Some insurance companies require you to do follow-up ADOS testing every three to five years. So this is where that falls into the category. Um, also, as Justine was talking to us earlier, this is one of those things that you can get testing or you can go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. That is just typically included in your medical health, in your medical benefit as a, one of those um, essential health benefits. I talked to you guys a little bit about it already, but just to keep in mind, if you have a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, that they do require you to go to the approved autism centers and other plans might not have that same requirement, but I have not yet seen a plan that doesn't require a specialist. So some form of developmental pediatrician, um, pediatric neurologist, some form of specialty in the field of being able to create or you know, do the appropriate testing for um, autism. And we kind of touched on this a little bit when we talked about the educational certification is not a medical diagnosis. So again, I strongly suggest if you have an educational diagnosis that you still have to follow these steps in order to get a medical diagnosis. So now what everybody has been waiting for, including myself, how am I gonna pay for this? Like what? things are we going to do to be able to afford this? So some popular terminology that most of you are probably familiar with, in-network and out-of-network. So that just means what doctors are affiliated with your plan. So if you have a Blue Care Network plan, which doctors can you go to? Um, and any of the doctors that are not affiliated with your plan, those are considered out-of-network. We also will talk about... Um, or just basically common terms you might hear, co-pays, co-insurance. Um, and the difference between co-pay and co-insurance is that co-pay is usually a fixed price. So every time you go, when you go to the doctor for a non-preventative service, so a sick visit, anything like that, you're gonna pay $20. Every time you go, it's gonna be the same price, $20 for a doctor visit, $30 maybe for a specialist visit, but it's the same price. Co-insurance, I'm gonna let Justine talk about that a little bit more when she talks about the pharmacy and the medical levels. Um, and she'll explain how those kind of are all inter are interchangeable or not necessarily interchangeable, but have some of the same characteristics. The maximum out of pocket is the most you're gonna pay. And we are definitely gonna talk about that some more. And the deductible is how much do you have to pay before your insurance takes on paying everything for you? All right, Justine, you're up. All right, so this often um, confuses people. So I like to say that health insurance has three phases. So you have your pre-deductible phase. And that is the phase before you meet your deductible. Let's say your deductible is $2,000.
So in before you have spent $2,000 out of pocket, you are in your pre-deductible phase. During that phase, you pay co-pays for anything that has a copay. So if you look at your summary of benefits, which we'll talk about a little later, but the thing that you get from your insurance company or from whatever insurance you've signed up for, anything that has a copay, you will pay that beginning in the pre-deductible stage day one. So $20 to go to primary care doctor copay, right? Then once you reach your deductible, you're in your after deductible phase. And that is when you start paying a coinsurance. So anything that you have um, in this uh, plan that we're creating, let's say it's a, a 70, 30, which means you're paying 30% coinsurance. So any charges that you have between at the end of phase one in, in phase two, which is your after deductible phase, you are going to pay 30% of those except for copays, which stay the whole time. So if you have a copay, you'll pay the copay. If it is something else, say it's a CT scan or um, an OT uh, appointment, you will pay 30% of that bill. Then phase three is after you hit your maximum out of pocket. So phase two goes from when you pay your deductible to when you hit your out of pocket max. And in phase three, after you hit your maximum out of pocket, you do not pay anything for covered services. You will not pay your coinsurances. You will not pay your co-pays anymore. You won't pay to pick up prescriptions. You don't pay anything as long as you are getting in-network services. So in-network versus out-of-network is important. Um, but so... Phase one, pre-deductible, you pay co-pays. Phase two, between your deductible and your maximum out-of-pocket, you continue to pay co-pays. You also pay a co-insurance percentage. And then in phase three, which is after your maximum out-of-pocket, you should pay $0 for in-network services. Any questions about that? I know that that can be confusing and difficult for people. And I think that we're gonna, when we do the um, plan comparison in a couple mm -hmm. slides, I think we'll really talk about that and be able to hit on it so people can see like how that money, what that money looks like, like yeah. what that spending pattern looks like. Um, pretty often when you're looking at health insurance, um, you'll see pharmacy tiers. Usually tier one is the least expensive. Those are your generics. And um, different companies have different tier structures, but they can all go all the way up to tier six. Um, and generally, as a general rule, um, the lower the number, the less expensive the medication is, and the higher the number, the more expensive the medication is. Um, and then metal levels are something that you will see often, especially when you're talking about marketplace plans. So in general, there are four of them. It is bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And that ties to what your coinsurance amount is. So a bronze plan in general is 60-40, which means the insurance company pays 60% and you pay 40% in that second phase. A silver plan is generally 70-30, so you pay that 30%. A gold plan is generally 80, 20, so you pay 20%. And then a platinum plan is generally 90, 10, so you pay 10% coinsurance. I can't wait to see what that's gonna look like. <laughs> so some other terminology that you hear often and we're gonna talk about again, but is high deductible, mid-range deductible and low deductible. And so she was kind of, Justine was just kind of talking us through like the bronze and civil, bronze and silver. So the metal level plans. And if you look, you'll be able to see what those look like. So generally a bronze or silver can be paired with an H HSA plan and the out-of-pocket max for this year, correct me if I'm wrong, is 85.50, right? That's correct. All right. maximum allowable, maximum out of pocket. All right, I'm gonna let you kind of go over with everyone and the next two slides. So the mid-range deductible, the low deductible, and then we'll talk about the next slide a little more too. 
Perfect. So a high deductible health plan is like a, an actual term. They call it an HDHP, a high deductible health plan. And those often compare with an HSA. So almost always, if you have an HSA, you have an, a high deductible health plan. And one of the requirements of those is that they do not have co-pays and the, generally the um, deductible and the maximum out of pocket are less. So I believe that the maximal, maximum allowable for an HSA for this year is 7235, which is a weird $7,235, which is a weird number. Um, but when you're doing an HSA plan, you're doing a trade-off. You can benefits, um, you can put money into an HSA account tax-free to a certain limit, which is great. Um, and also your maximum out of pocket and your deductibles are generally lower than what is allowed in for the maximums. Um, on the other side, you do not have co-pays for things. You will pay your full agreed rate for any services that you receive up to your deductible. So phase one, there's no co-pays, you pay full price. And then in phase two, you pay your percentage. If you have a phase two, some of them have uh, the deductible and the maximum out of pocket are the same. Um, and then your phase three begins sooner because your maximum out of pocket is lower. So can I just interrupt? Cause something you brought up that I think we should just kind of quickly talk about is the agreed rate. So, yes. and what that looks like. So say you go in for an X-ray and the X-ray is $350 but your insurance company and the provider have agreed that they're only going to pay them $150. The family should only be responsible for the $150, not yeah. for the $300 with an HSA. So that's important to remember because if you get a bill and it says $300, but you gave them your HSA card, unless that is the agreed rate with the insurance company, you do not owe them the full $300. You should look at your EOB, which is your explanation of benefits, and there should be a line where it says insurance company discount or insurance company reduction, something like that. And that shows you that they ran it through the insurance and that you did get the total amount reduced to that agreed rate. Yeah, sometimes too, it'll say provider paid, like it'll say provider paid or, or patient responsibility. So a patient responsibility might be and then there's also a line for like a write-off. So it might be four lines there too that you might wanna just kind of look at. Also, we didn't talk about it, but on that EOB, it should also tell you what your max out-of-pocket is as well as your deductible mm -hmm. and if you've used it. So it should say, let's say your max was the 8550, it should say the 8550 minus 150. So you should actually be able to see on your explanation of benefits where that amount was deducted. Okay. Do we have a question? I'm sorry. There is a question. I believe this was from a slide or two back. Um, oh. And it is a couple of questions in one, but I'll read it all together. Okay. So phase one, it's co-pays or deductibles depending on the service. And then do co-pays count toward the deductible or do co-pays only go towards the OOP and not the deductible? That's correct. Co-pays only go towards the max out of pocket and not towards the deductible. That was you. That was that. That was that. Was that the whole thing? <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Um, Co-pays only go to the maximum out of pocket, so it does come off of your MOOP, um, but it does not come off of your deductible. Your deductible is only things that you pay a percentage on. Insurance companies are always doing things a little bit different. I would say that that's 98% of the time, um, but it's always difficult. One of the reasons that Shanta and I say, like, keep in touch with your insurance company and make sure you're communicating is, I, I don't like to say, yes, that is true 100% of the time. But I would say 98% of the time, copays do not go to your deductible, but they do go to your out-of-pocket max. Um, a mid-range deductible plan usually has a, a middle price. Um, we'll talk about one of those here in a little bit. Um, mid-range is generally silver or gold, um, and it usually has better co-pays for doctor's visits. 
And then a low deductible plan is usually in that gold or platinum range. Um, sometimes, but not always, it's paired with a lower maximum out of pocket. And we'll look at some plans here in a minute where that's true and where it's not true. Um, really and I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just thinking, can you have an employer-based high deductible plan too, right? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I just know we have the marketplace um, total on here, but I wanted to make people aware that you can have an employer-based um, HSA plan too. And yeah. the deductible could be a little bit higher than that too, right? Or is this a, everybody in Michigan is the 8550? Or is that just for um, help for the Affordable Care Act plans? That's a good question. I believe that it's a national law um, that 8550 is the max that you can have in network, but out of network maxes can be higher, especially on large group plans. Do we have any questions or are we okay? I think it's just to clarify um, what you're saying. So therefore some covered services in phase one will only have a deductible instead of a copay. Yes. So it will, it will just get charged to the deductible. There is not a specific amount. So you would pay what is the agreed rate between the doctor and the insurance company. So again, in the case of the x-ray, um, cash price is $350. You go in for an x-ray, you're in phase one. Um, cash price is $350. Because you have a health insurance plan that gets discounted to $150, but you are responsible for that full $150 until you reach your deductible. Whereas in phase two, that would be, you would only be responsible for whatever percentage that your plan um, required you to provide. And that's with the HSA, right? So let's just say they didn't have an HSA. They just had like this mid range where it was a 70, 30, let's say. So mm -hmm. when they started and they went to the doctor's office, it would be the same, right? So they would still be in that phase one where they have to pay the full amount. And then after the phase one, they would just pay the 70, 30. It depends on the plan. Some plans will have a specific copay for an x-ray. And if that is the case, then you will pay that copay and not the agreed rate. But if you had a CT scan, which didn't have a specific copay, then you would pay the agreed rate for that CT scan. Um, that's all going to be in your summary of benefits. Um, so that is something that we'll touch on here in a little bit, but unfortunately there's not like a blanket statement where yes, like it's always covered this way. Anything in phase one that doesn't have a copay, you will pay the agreed rate for until you hit your deductible. Okay. Did we did that? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm going to say last one and then we can move on. So does okay. co-insurance take care of the copay? No, you continue to pay the copay all the way to your maximum out of pocket. In phase one, you pay agreed rate up to your deductible. In phase two, you pay your percentage up to your maximum out of pocket, but a copay will stay consistent all the way through the policy. So and I, until you, okay. you get your max. So if you have a $20 copay for a primary care doctor, you will pay that in both phase one and phase two. And then you should pay nothing in phase three. And I think it's good to, I, I think I kind of am on the same um, page with the person asking the question. Basically what, I, what I, it sounds like they want to know is, do you have to pay the copay and the coinsurance? And the oh. answer is yes. <laughs> so they're separate. So you could potentially, I mean, not the copay and the coinsurance, but the, you could go to the doctor's office and pay the full amount and then still be responsible for at a later time, only 30% of that. Is that what you're asking? Is that kind here's of it a, or no? Here's a good example of that. Say you go to your primary care doctor and your throat hurts and they give you a strep test, okay? Your primary care doctor copay is $20. So for that line, Shanta talked earlier about CPT codes. For that visit, you will pay $20, but you also got a strep test and there's no copayment amount for a strep test. There's no charge, specific charge. So if you are in phase one, then you will pay $20 for the visit. 
and then the agreed rate for the strep test. In phase two, you will still pay $20 for the visit, but you only pay the percentage of that for the strep test. And then in phase three, you won't pay anything. Does that help? I guess I'm looking for a nod from Shanta because- Oh no, we're waiting. So, <laughs> no, we're just waiting for Kara to, to make sure that that's um, what they, if that helped. I believe it did. And I think putting an example in context was helpful. And they did just say, yes, it was. Okay, good. Awesome. Sometimes you got to hear the money to make it make sense. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Oh. Uh -oh. yeah. Did I skip some? No, here we go. No, I didn't. Um, okay, oh, so yeah. three more terms that might you might hear. An HSA or a health savings account is always paired with that HDHP, the high deductible health plan, reduced maximum out of pocket, no co pays. Um, limited network plans, so in network plus out of network coverage. An HMO or an EPO is going to be a limited network plan, meaning you have to stay in network for them to cover it. In that case, urgent care and emergency care is covered as if it's a network anywhere in the United States. So if you broke your leg and you need to go to an urgent care or an emergency room, you are not expected to call ahead to find out if they are in network. You should just go there. If you need immediate care, it will be covered as if it's in network. But if you are calling to make an appointment because your foot is sore and you want to get with a podiatrist and that appointment is in the future, so you make it for next week, those have to be in network for them to be covered. There's also something you'll hear and we'll actually touch on it a little bit. Um, it's called a catastrophic plan and it's available under people for people who are under 30 years old. Um, we don't write a lot of them, but with a child only plan, this is an option. Um, it has a high deductible and a high maximum out of pocket, but a low copay per month. Um, and it only allows you three primary care doctor's visits um, at the copay amount. And then if you have more than three, then you have to pay a agreed rate for them. So just different phrases you might hear tossed around so that you can feel comfortable with them. And just before we get into the next slide, are there any questions, sorry. <clears throat> are there any more questions about this? Because now we're gonna actually show you examples of what that looks like. There is one more. In okay. phase two, the co-insurance will be percentage of the agreed rate and not the full rate, correct? Yes, exactly right. Thank you. Yeah. And that's really good to like think of it in phases. I think it makes it a lot easier. Even for me hearing it again, it makes it a lot easier for me when I think of it in phases. So now when I go to the doctor, I'm like, okay, I haven't reached this threshold yet. So now I'm in phase one. Yeah. All right. Okay. So here we go. Don't Show panic. Me. Don't <laughs> panic. <laughs> My first thing is, I think that a lot of people, when they see a lot of numbers, they're like, I'm never going to get this. And they, they sort of tune out. So don't do that. We're here and we're going to do this together. And it's going to be not as bad as you think. Okay. So there are certain considerations that we need to take into account when we look at a health insurance plan. And most people, I feel like when they look at a health insurance plan, they sort of throw a dart at a board and they're like, that's the one I'm gonna take. So I wanna talk to you about why you might choose one plan or another plan. And the first thing that I wanna mention is that the first thing that I always ask clients is what are your needs? And in the case of a child who has ABA therapy, you're almost guaranteed to hit your maximum out of pocket. We all know that that's not inexpensive and you're using it often, most of the time daily, right? And so we are going to assume that you are going to hit your maximum out of pocket because your child needs those services. When we write a child only plan, most of the time we write it because Somebody works for a large company and that company does not want to provide ABA therapy benefits to all of their um, employees and their employees' families. 
and they choose not to, and that's their prerogative. So our next step is to go to the marketplace during open enrollment and to write a child only policy. Because you have access to another plan, you have to pay full price for that plan. If you are lower income, and we can talk about thresholds in the Q&A later. Um, if you are lower income and you don't have other options, then oftentimes that can be discounted. But if you have commercial insurance and the, you and the rest of the family are on commercial insurance, you have to pay full price for those, which is fine. We just know going in that that is the case. So if you look at these different plans, we picked them to illustrate a handful of different things. The one all the way to the right is the PHP Platinum 500. This is an HMO plan and it is generally the Lansing area. Ingham, Eaton and Clinton are where this plan does the best. Um, but one of the reasons that we chose it to show you is because that maximum out of pocket is so drastically lower. So as you can see here, the maximum out of pocket is $3,000. When you are looking at health insurance and you know that you're going to hit your maximum out of pocket or you're getting a plan for a child that you know is going to hit your maximum out of pocket, then your math is your premium per month times the number of months plus your maximum out of pocket. So line one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that says cost for a 10 year old um, is going to give us our premium, $326.73 a month for this plan. And then if we take that number and we multiply it by 12 months, and then we add it to our maximum out of pocket, then we get our total risk. The most that you can pay for a year for a 10 year old who has this plan is $6,920.76. And that is not nothing, right? But what we wanna do is we wanna reduce that total risk as much as possible. And that math is really easy when we know that we're gonna hit an out-of-pocket max. So this plan, this PHP plan is not helpful in Detroit and it's not helpful in Traverse City because this is an HMO plan that's tied to one specific area. But if you're within that area, then we look for the max, the lowest maximum out of pocket. And then we do our math 12 times premium plus max to get our total risk. Let's take a look at another plan. If we're taking a look at our priority health plan, the, the second one over. So this one is just priority silver 3400 HMO. Our deductible is $3,400. If you are a moderate health insurance user, the deductible might be important. If you have a child in ABA therapy five days a week, you do not care what that deductible is because you're going to hit your out-of-pocket max. There is no reason to pay for a higher deductible if you know you're going to hit your maximum out-of-pocket. So this plan would give you $30 primary care visit, $45 specialist, $75 urgent care visit, and it's going to cost you $272.87 a month. Priority Health is pretty strong on the west side of the state, and they definitely have been expanding a lot. You'll see them in most counties now in the Lower Peninsula. Um, so if you're looking at a Priority Health plan, make sure that you check in, make sure that your providers are, are in network. Um, if you're not in their target market, um, and your, our total risk here is 272.87 times 12 months plus our maximum out of pocket, which is 85.50. And that gives us a total risk of $11,824.44. The maximum out of pocket that we have paid is 85.50 on this plan. So really quick, I just want to tell people that that's why when you're looking at the plans on the marketplace, that you are making sure if nothing else, you put in your zip code and your family income. Yes. Um, because your zip code, so the first plan that we talked about, basically, you can only use it in those three counties. So if you don't put in the accurate zip code, you could be getting a plan that you can't use at home. 
So it's really important if you're looking at the Affordable Care Act plans that you put in your zip code. Yes, definitely, absolutely, yes. Um, we're gonna move one to the left again. This is another priority health plan, but it is a, it's what's called a limited network. So this is a priority health plan, but it relies only on their St. John's Providence network, which is a hospital and a hospital system. Um, I'm gonna remind everybody again that no matter what plan you have, urgent care and emergency care is covered as if it's a network anywhere in the United States. But if you're calling ahead for an appointment like ABA therapy, then you have to do that in network. And this is going to provide you a smaller network, but it's also going to provide you a better premium. So if your providers are in network with the St. John's Providence, you are getting a better deal. This is going to be exactly the same. So if you look down the line between priority and priority St. John's Providence, line by line, it is exactly the same plan. It is just a smaller network. And by accepting that smaller network, you are reducing your premium for your 10 year old by about $80 a month. And that brings your total risk down by about $1,000 a year. And then we're going to move one more over to our Blue Care Network. This is an HSA plan, and that's why it's going to look a little different to us. So this is the Select Bronze HMO. Blue Care Network is pretty strong all over the UNA, the, the UNA, all over the Lower Peninsula. So generally, um, a BCN plan is going to be accepted most places um, from Traverse City to Detroit to Grand Rapids to Lansing. Um, the deductible and the maximum out of pocket are lower and they're the same, which is common for an HSA plan. So we've got our 6950 for both of those. When we have the PCP specialist in urgent care, it says no charge. And this is a really careful space because what they mean is no charge after maximum out of pocket or after deductible, same in this case. So any plan that says no charge, take a look one more over to the right on that summary of benefits and make sure you're extra carefully reading it because this means no charge after deductible. You are gonna pay the agreed rate up to your deductible. But again, if you are doing ABA therapy five days a week, you're gonna hit your maximum out of pocket anyway. And so there is no reason to pay more money for a silver plan with a higher max when you can pay less money for a bronze plan with a lower maximum out of pocket. So you can see that the cost here is pretty similar. For the BCN plan, you're looking at 182.19 versus 193.50 for the St. John's Providence. But because that maximum out of pocket is lower, your total risk is reduced by $1,700. Does that all make sense? So here's how we're going to see if they if it makes sense. So I'm going to leave this up and just in the chat, if you feel comfortable and you can do it so it goes to the panelist only if you want to, which plan looks like the best plan? Just put it in the chat to the panelists. Which, which plan do you think is the best plan? And then we'll see. We'll see how well we did, Justine, with explaining this. Sounds good. And let's say um, the best plan, if they all had the same network, it's hard because like the best plan for somebody in Lansing, yes, exactly. It depends on where you live. So the best plan for somebody in Lansing versus the best plan um, for somebody in general. Yeah, so I agree. So the best plan if we all lived in Lansing. Yeah, what's the best plan if we all lived in Lansing? Do we have some answers here? One said BCN, one said PHP. Yeah, the BCN came in before we stipulated the Lansing area. So I think they're following us. Uh, it is a shame that there's so much variability across the state. One of the reasons that PHP can be so much more cost effective is because they really only focus on that three county area. Um, whereas BCN has to average out costs all over the state. 
Um, and so they have to just mitigate a lot more risk. There's more potential, like whether it's a, a rural doctor in Clare County or somebody in Canton. All right. Well, thank you all for participating. Um, as in good fashion with everything we do, we're going to repeat this one more time. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, oh, I didn't know my annotations don't go away. Uh -oh. We are going to, um, I'll let you pick just one so we can show them how the summary of benefits are all the same. Yeah, let's take a look at the just the silver plan from Priority Health. So this, time, go ahead. this is the um, summary of benefits for the silver plan that we just discussed. And um, she's going to make it look a little bit bigger, I think, here in just a second. Um, but all summary of benefits are required to look the same. And that is a change that came in with the Affordable Care Act so that it looks similar for each individual plan and you are, can more easily compare one plan to another. So the top line for all um, summary benefits should be what is the overall deductible. And then there's information here on that. And then if you scroll down a little bit, there is a what is the limit for, they're the out of pocket limit for this plan. Um, some will say maximum out of pocket and that's what it is that you're looking at. An individual amount for deductible or uh, maximum out of pocket is always half of the family amount. So the family amount is always double the individual. That's not useful for people who are two person families because you'd have to hit that for both anyway. But if you have a husband and wife and four children, for instance, then only two of them have to meet their deductible for the entire family to be considered phase two. And then only two of them have to hit their maximum out of pocket or some combination of all six have to have hit their maximum out of pocket twice and then they are in they move on to their phase three or no more payment um, if you scroll down a bit more on this you will also see um, each one of these is required to have a line for primary care and specialist and those should be listed out um, other practitioners, preventative care and screening, immunizations, those are all provided at no charge, no matter what the plan is. And then if you look at something like here at the bottom, if you have a test, you have a diagnostic test, oh, a little bit up, sorry. Um, a diagnostic test, it lists x-rays and blood work. This is 30% coinsurance after deductible. It's a silver plan, so it's a 70-30. So you're paying the entire agreed rate in phase one. And then in phase two for this, you are paying 30% of total. But for imaging, you have a copay. So if you have a CT, a PET scan, or an MRI, you pay $150 per service. Um, and then it looks like after your deductible, you pay the 30% coinsurance, which is probably less. You will you also- I'm sorry, do we have a question, Kara? Are we okay? Um, just to answer this question, yes, this presentation recording will be available on our website within a week. Good. People are like, this is a lot. Can I see this again? <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Um, okay, a little bit lower. You're also going to see here's those tiers that we talked about. So Priority Health has five tiers, but tier one is divided into 1A and 1B. And then on the left side here, you'll always see a link to what's called the formulary. And if you look up a drug on the formulary, it will tell you what tier it is. And then you can refer back here and figure out what the, um, what the uh, co-payment or co-insurance is for it. Um, a little bit lower, we have uh, urgent care and emergency room services. And then um, a little bit further down, we have mental health slash behavioral health services, um, which is going to be that mental health piece if you need it. And then a little bit further down is going to be your, these are gonna be your uh, habilitative services, which is where they consider PT, OT, ST, 
Um, and you'll actually see, I love this. Um, we now have actual re uh, references to ABA therapy. So um, interesting priority. I'm, somebody asked about priority health earlier. I'm not as familiar with it, but I am seeing some limitations here that um, are surprising me. Um, child eye exams and glasses uh, are have some coverages um, on ACA plans, which is nice. Um, dental insurance, no, just the um, A, just the uh, glasses and and um, eye exams. And then oftentimes in the bottom, this is where you see your excluded services and other coverages. So if they have notes that didn't fit anywhere in the top googly gook. Um, then this is where you will find those. So often you'll find limitations on the number of mental health plans or the number of PTOTSDs. Um, this is where you're gonna find all that information. This is the silver plan that we looked at earlier, but all summary of benefits should look generally the same. And that is required now so that you can compare one to another. And as a note, another thing is it's always good to start looking at these before you need them. So if you're going to do open enrollment in October, it might be a good job to start looking or a good idea to start looking at them in like August. So that way you are actually looking at what your plan is going to look like. And if you're wanting to change plans, you can actually see that too, right? So if you had the BCN and you wanted to change to the Priority Health Network, you can make sure that your doctors and specialists, your providers are all accepting of that insurance because this really only works if you go to an in-network provider. So if you're going out of network, then <laughs> this kind of blows all of the everything out the water. So it's good to start a little bit earlier. You can even start now and just getting familiar with the website and looking at it if that's what you're interested in. All right. Did you wanna look at one more? We are, you think we're okay? How are we for time? Okay. Um, I, I, I think we are probably needing to move into the Q and A, so. Okay. All right, so just a couple reminders um, and the final steps. So, We've looked at pretty much how you figure out what your plan is, what services should be available, how you access those services, and then how you look at your bottom line. Like, so how you figure out how much money these services are going to cost you. As a reminder, many of the insurance companies, even if you have a Blue Cross Blue Shield, a Blue Care Network plan, you might have to interact with a different plan for authorization. So you might have to see something that says new directions, value options, Magellan, some, some of those. And those are the people that actually provide those additional services for ABA and some of your unlimited coverage. We cannot stress enough, contact your insurance provider at every step of the process. So every time you think you got it good, just contact and make sure have your providers, once you, you know, accept your provider and you know that that's where you're going to go for service, have them call just to make sure that the information you have is the same information that they were given. And finally, parents know best. So when you're figuring out all of these different services and you're navigating, make sure you do your parent participation. Make sure you are getting progress notes. What I would suggest is if you have like just a little tote that you throw all your information in, that's what I use. Um, some people are really sophisticated, they use binders. I just throw everything in the tote. Um, your explanation of benefits, your summary of benefits, just throw it all in the tote once a year, kind of go look through it. Make sure you keep your progress notes in that tote so you can see what progress your child is making. If you decide to switch to a different therapist, you can even see what they already worked on. And you can also make sure that you're coordinating services with all of your therapists. So that wraps up this portion, but we are definitely going to do Q&A for anyone who is interested.